Meow. <laughs> I'm the cat, she's the dog. Because today we are talking about animals, but not just pets on board, are we? No, we're going to talk good ones, we're going to talk bad ones, and there are some that are in between. But if you're on a boat, if you're intending to live on a boat, you need to be happy about having animals living with you. I think that's probably the bottom line, isn't it? The bo and the bottom line is, is that a lot of the time you have no choice over the animals that you've got living <laughs> with you. So you've got to kind of put up with it and learn how to cope with them. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. So we're going to go through the types of animals that you will encounter on land, on sea, on the boat, in the air. They are everywhere. They are part of sailing, aren't they? Shall we just start off with pets, though? OK, let's let's get the, the pretty critters out the way. Yes. So we had the prettiest of, and most useful of them all for a very long time here on Esper. We had Millie the cat. She came to us as a kitten and she was one hell of a ratter. She was. Now, cats on board, of course, cats. Cats just go with boats, don't they? I think when you think of boats, all the way through history, uh, we often think of cats on board boats. Ship's cat? Ship's cat, yeah, because they are great ratters. And we'll come on to rats in a moment. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, have you got any historical facts about cats on board? Um, I didn't really find very much, but I did discover that over the centuries, um, sailors have had not just cats, but all kinds of animals on board. And one of the theories uh, of what, what they know is that Sailors would be away for a very long time and having animals like dogs, cats or monkeys, even um, parrots. Yeah, anything really that they could substitute for their wives, families, loved ones. They just needed something there as a companion. Mm. And it was a way for the sailors to have, have some kind of emotional contact with life. So they provided a great prop. So that's what I know. That's well, what I found Millie out. certainly provided a prop for us, didn't she? She did. Yeah, she really did. She was really, really great and very soothing. I mean, there's there's mountains of information about the importance of pets to humans, but I'll let you go and have a look at that yourselves if you want to. What, so, about, what about dogs? Um, dogs, well, so right. So cats have a, a function, which is to kill vermin, mm -hmm. and they do that very well. And uh, we would recommend a cat if you're going to have an animal, have a cat. Dogs, I don't know the history of dogs. There have been dogs on boats. I mean, there are certain dogs like Jack Russells and so forth that will go down holes and eat things for you. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, I reckon a Jack Russell would have a, go at a rat if it saw one. I it? reckon it would too. Yeah. Fierce little animals, aren't they? Yes, I mean, we love dogs. We didn't have a dog. We had a cat instead. But dogs are more difficult to keep on board simply because they require more maintenance. You need to be walking them two or three times a day, every day really, literally every day. Some countries don't want them there. Uh, sometimes there's nowhere that you can land a dinghy to walk the dog. And certainly, obviously, going across oceans, you're going to have to train that dog to do its business somewhere on the boat. So they do require a bit more. Also, they're a little bit more difficult to get through customs than cats. They're... Yeah, we, we've never had a problem with cats and customs. Despite us worrying about it, it's never been an issue because as far as they're concerned, if the animal stays on board the boat, uh, then it's fine but of course they know that dogs you do need to walk them so yeah. they are probably a bit more aware that those dogs are going to go ashore unlike a cat that said as we are sitting here in this beautiful anchorage there is a catamaran over there was it a trimaran try it's a try yeah, yes no, now they have a certain breed of dog who we have met before um are they belgian i can't remember we can't remember the small breed. black yappy dogs but full of character but they were bred specifically, and I think back in the day, as canal boat uh, guards. So they, are, they were designed to live on board a boat, to live outside, and most importantly, to not need so much exercise that they don't need those two or three uh, walks every day as much as, say, you know, the more familiar breeds that, we're, you know, that we know. Yeah. Um, a friend of ours has one, doesn't he? And mm. he... Uh, that dog never goes inside the boat, lives right. out on deck. Yeah. And they do make great guard dogs because 
Well, if you don't know dogs and you get a dog barking at you, you're immediately going to step away from that boat. And mm. that's what these dogs do. Every time you go past them in the dinghy, uh, they're, they're there on deck, running up and down the deck, <laughs> yapping away. Uh, but they do make very good guard dogs. And so if anyone can remember the breed. I know, I'll try and remember and put it up on know. screen. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so dogs and cats, obviously, lots of them around all over the world. Oh, one problem um, with a cat, you can't. It's very difficult to take animals into Australia and New Zealand and the UK. There are certain countries around the world that really don't want any kind of animal coming in there because their rabies free and they want to keep it that way. So just be aware if you are coming cruising and you're bringing your dog, you have to have all the right paperwork. And even then you may not get into Australia mm. or New Zealand. So just be careful about that. So those are the obvious ones. Yep. We've seen other animals on boats. We pulled up alongside, well, a boat pulled up alongside us in a, on a jetty once, and they had three parrots. Yeah, they had a huge cage on the back of their boat, and uh, you could frequently hear these parrots talking to themselves. It got quite confusing <laughs> at one point because we'd heard the owners had gone away for the weekend, and yet we could still hear this talking coming from their boat. And sure enough, it were parrots. And I think parrots live for a good 20 or so years or longer. Long, I believe. Longer. Yes, yeah, yeah. they can last for ages, parrots. <laughs> They loved those birds and they were very well looked after and Millie was fascinated by them. She was. wanted to go and pay them a visit, but we persuaded her not to do that. So, yes, he certainly we've seen parrots on boats. What other animals have we seen on boats? Well, I was just going to say, just on parrots, yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to throw in there that I'm not particularly happy about cage birds yeah. generally as a rule. So, it, for me, that's, uh, that's a no-no, I think. Yeah, that's our personal preference. We don't like to see any bird that's caged. So, up to you. Do what you've got to do, but try and let the bird go for it. <laughs> you can't do that on the boat. You could do that at home. Well, I think that sentiment Maybe comes that's... from being in Asia and seeing, yeah. uh, you see a lot of the young men mainly with caged birds and they enter these caged birds into singing competitions at the weekends to basically gambling to, to win prize money and uh, to put bets on which bird is going to sing the best. And so you will frequently see people scooting around with their curds in pages cages and, and you see these creatures and they are beautiful little things aren't they and yeah it is quite upsetting to see them caged but anyway that is just personal opinion um let's move on to yes other... i mean there are people that keep um rabbits you know on the boats and things like that so yeah sure pets on boats fine there is the famous hen that went round the world with the 20 odd year old french sailor um hang on i've got his name here gurek Soudé. he was 22 when he embarked on what, his voyage. Hen or the sailor? <laughs> the the sa sailor was 22. Right. <laughs> yes, I don't know how old the hen, hen was. Um, and this hen went with him. I think the idea originally was to have, to have eggs. But talk about becoming a companion. He loved that animal. And it got stuck with him in the ice pack in the north as he was going across the Northwest Passage for months on end. It was just him and the hen. So they developed a very close relationship. <laughs> it's really famous. You can find out more about him online. There's loads of, loads of stories about him. But anyway, do you think we finished with pets? Anything else? No, but I think that just proves the yeah. point that, um, you know, all animals, all sentient beings have yes. some kind of emotion. Mm. And we see that with so many different types of animals. You know, we know, you know even on land, we see, say, goat herders forming a very strong bond yeah. with, with their pet goats. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to have a goat, I'd but I don't think that would really goat. work on a boat. Would yeah, I'd love, love a goat. They're just fantastic animals. So obviously, there's, so that's that's the main thing. You know, everyone wants to know about pets on boats. We've done quite a few videos about having a pet on board and what to do and what not to do and all that sort of thing. If you look back in our catalogue, you'll find them. I'll try and link them in the description, uh, particularly how we trained Millie to use the heads and stuff like that. So, yeah, go ahead, get a pet, but just think about whether you really want to do it and whether it's good for the pet or good for you. Just think about it. Mm. So, moving on. Mm -hmm. It's not just pets on a boat. So the obvious thing that springs to mind, of course, um, actually before the obvious one, I'm going to talk about insects. They count, don't they, they're animals? Well, they do. I mean, we were talking about this only, frequent, uh, only recently that someone got... Uh, what are they called? The, the wood termites on board their yeah, boat. Yeah. Now that's an insect, but of course, as a yachty, Ugh. you've got wood everywhere. Even fiberglass boats have a lot of wood everywhere, and uh, wood termites is not something you no. want on board your boat. It was the boat next to us. <laughs> oh, oh no, that was another incident. Oh, okay. I'm thinking more recently. There was a there's a guy that uh, that had them on board. So right. 
yeah, those are the kind of insects you don't want. Not unusual to see ants. We picked up ants uh, in one of the boatyards recently, and every now and then we see a, a trail of ants. They're not they're tiny. They're, they are tiny. They're like, this is about two mil or something mm. like that. They're the tiniest ants I've ever seen. I mean, we've had different types of ants, but these are these little tiny ones at the moment. Mm. Haven't worked out where they're coming from. They're not really doing any damage, so I don't really mind. We, as far as we know. As far as we know. I don't think they do damage. Um, I mean, you, you can get away with ants. So the other nasties are weevils in the food. Yeah. Oh, yes, we've had a few of those. Um, usually you they... should just explain what they are because, okay. uh, you know, I had never heard really of weevils right. until I was started living on a boat. Yes. So we should explain what they are. They tend to be, they're tiny animals, about the same size as a small ant, and they tend to live in um, wheat and flour and that kind of thing. And when you buy something, it may have the eggs in it, and then they'll gradually hatch out. They're so, so tiny, and they just live and breed in your flour. And sometimes you'll have one or two, and sometimes there'll be a huge batch of them, but just one or two, most sailors sift them out. I think it's worth pointing out that you probably unwittingly buy yeah. bags of flour with weevil eggs yeah. in them and don't even realise they are in there. Yeah. Uh, it's only when you leave them in storage for a long time that eventually they do hatch. Yeah. And as you say, sometimes you'll open a bag of flour and there they're all like these little black specks in your flour. Yes. But up until that point, they're just eggs and you wouldn't know they were in there. No, it's, it's sort of... It happens more in the tropics. It didn't happen so much in the Med, I don't think, did it? It was really after we left the Med. They obviously mm. like, I don't know, maybe the, the, it's not so processed, the flour here, so it just it catches things. But there's certainly one way to, to, to avoid it is to keep your flour in the freezer or, or rather the fridge because uh, the eggs won't hatch. You'll be eating the eggs. They will do absolutely no damage, by the way. They're That's not a bit poisonous. Of protein, isn't nothing it? wrong with it, no. And uh, sometimes when you... You're on board a boat, they might say, oh, there's a couple of weevils in there somewhere. <laughs> Enjoy them. <laughs> but yeah, so weevils, they're quite common. Mosquitoes. Ugh. Whoa. But worse than that for me are the cockroaches. Yeah, I think you're more obsessed with cockroaches <laughs> than I am. I'm, they're so big. Yeah, I mean, they're still a bother and there's nothing worse than being seated in your cockpit or in your saloon eating your dinner and then just catching a little glimpse of a shadow scuttling past. And of course, you know that once you've got one cockroach, you know that there's a whole load more hiding away. You can't leave those. You have to destroy them. You have to find the nest and you do have to get rid of them. It's not like the ants are not quite so bad. But I mean, you've got quite good at the whole preventative side yeah. of things. You know, we, we used to get infestations and there's no rhyme or reason as to why they would start it's nothing to do with a dirty boat right. um you know we we know people well we ourselves we've seen cockroaches fly into yeah. the boat so where they come from is difficult to identify and but anyway so you've got round to actually laying down boric acid isn't it yeah so a very thin trail of boric acid in the obvious places where where they are where you've seen them um, they pick it up and they die and they pass it on and gradually you just kill you just kill them it takes about two weeks and they're all gone uh, and then you just try and keep them off the boat but easier said than done they'll come on board with your shopping they'll come on board if you're tied to land anywhere in any marina no matter how clean the marina is you'll get them so you just have to be vigilant and um, and just keep, keep a good eye on them. We should say, actually, being in marinas is a recipe for attracting yeah, all yeah. kinds of creatures on board. I, I mean, look at Millie. She used to climb yeah. on board other people's boats, much as we try to dissuade her from doing that. And that's a household pet. But you will get rats on board. You will get cockroaches. You will pick up creatures uh, from pontoons, which, of course, are attached to, to land. And perhaps there's lots of rubbish uh, on the shore by the pontoon where yeah. rats will live. Monkeys even go on boats yep. in marinas and on the hard, so you have to look out for those little buggers. They can bite and they can carry disease. So, in fact, living on a boat when it's attached to land in any form um, is almost like a David Attenborough film, isn't it? Because there's so much nature going on. Well, that provides a nice link <laughs> to our current pet. Yes. We're talking about cockroaches. Yes. Because uh, this yes. current pet that we have on board, I actually have a little video clip yes. of him with a live cockroach in his mouth. Yes. And he, he is? is? He is Mr. T, mm -hmm. and he is a, a really 
huge. I can't remember what they're called. What they're called? Tokai. Tokai. <laughs> it's a really huge Tokai. That's why it's called of, Mr. T. Yes, Mr. T. The Tokai is a kind of. They're a kind of gecko. But they're very big geckos that live over here, and they make the sound of a Tokai, which is Tokai. Guy, if you hear that sound anywhere, that's a tokai. Mm -hmm. And I didn't talk about mosquitoes earlier because I was going to bring them in when we talk about Mr. T because he is fantastic at killing insects. He'll eat any insect. And by the way, we're classifying him as a pet <laughs> because he's actually been on board Esper for over a year. Yeah. We think we picked him up when we hauled out last year and he's been on board ever since. Yeah. And um, we see him most evenings. They're nocturnal. So he uh, rests during the day and then sort of around about eight o'clock, nine o'clock, he'll put in an, an appearance. Yeah. First of all, scuttling through the saloon and quite often he hangs up by the galley. Now, he's not hanging out by the galley because that's where the food is. That is where we once upon a time had an ant infestation. Yes, yes. Well, I say gone. ant infestation. It was it was just a, ants were coming from somewhere, but they were coming from the galley. And I think he just got into the habit of hanging out in the galley to pick up any ants he could yeah. find. And as a consequence, we have no cockroaches nope. and no ants. No, nope. he's really, really brilliant. We love him. We don't really speak, you know, we can't get that close to him. He's big. I mean, from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail, I should think 25 centimetres. Yeah, yeah, close at least. to that. It's a big animal. It's much bigger than the regular kind of um small reptiles that you see and and, and as beautiful as he looks because yeah. they are beautiful little yeah. animals they are quite ferocious yeah. if you they're, they're mini dinosaurs yeah. you know they are lizards so they uh, can be quite aggressive if you get close to them and so mr t quite often makes this funny i call it a quacking yeah. sound he's like, wah, wah, if you get close to <laughs> yeah. him uh, or if you happen to walk past him and he's sitting in the shadows and you don't see him there, occasionally he'll run across your foot. Yeah, he's to... run on my foot. He'd had a go at my ankles once. I was getting <laughs> in in the dark from the cockpit. We came back and I opened the cockpit up first, put my foot down on the top top step and I felt this thing on my ankles and it, it didn't draw blood or anything, but I think it was him getting a bit of a shock with his great big foot coming down. But we love Mr T and... Uh, what we, what we would say is if any gecko comes on your boat, please let it remain. If you've got a cat, it won't because the cat will eat it. Millie ate all the geckos that used to come after Millie left us. We've made a point of letting geckos stay because they are really good at getting mm. rid of mosquitoes and all kinds of insects. Mm. So, yeah, um, go for it. Keep missing. The other thing is that over here, they're prized. They're actually the Tokai gecko, the one we have, are really prized in homes because they kill mosquitoes and insects. They regard them as a very useful animal to have around the home. So we're eternally grateful for Mr. Well, Tokai. They're not Mr. just prized here for eating animals. They are actually prized pets as well. Yes. So there is an international market for yeah. them. And sadly, they are captured and sold uh, traded to other countries, including in the West. Yes, they are. Yeah, and, and kept in poor little. Uh, what are they called? What are those aquariums called for animals? Uh, there's a certain name okay. for them. It, it slipped my mind. Right. But, uh, so they'll stick them in a you know in a tank in a glass tank, which again is not really the life for a, no. a big a big. I wouldn't like have said that. so. Not mad about that, but especially as we see them out out here in in the wild. I did check them on the IUCN list, which is the the endangered list for animals, world, wild, wild animals. And at the moment, they're not on it, but there is a big thing going on to say that they're about to come on it, that they are becoming vulnerable and they are becoming endangered because they are um, caught and hunted. Mm. But also they have been generally regarded as food in Southeast Asia. And there's been a big education program to teach people not to eat them. Did you know that liking and subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed? Go on, give us a helping hand. So we can't talk about animals on boats without talking about rats. Some people have rats as pets. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I met a guy when I was a student in Manchester, I knew this. He was a proper hedge monkey mm -hmm. and he had this battered old long trench coat and uh, he used to have a rat living in a sling under his arm. You're joking. And every now and then he'd get a banana out and the rat would come out. It's a proper pet. But wow. uh, I mean, that's the thing. When you look at a rat and they're not chewing away at all your um, wires and cables and mm -hmm. things, they're actually little sweet creatures, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And they don't necessarily have loads of disease either mm. you know they just live in their lives like any anybody else but 
you really don't want on, on the boat for the very reason you've just said is that they do chew through electric cables, they chew through everything. It's not just food that they go for. And I'll tell you the other thing, since we've had them, I've now discovered that they poo everywhere. Mm. And that's what's horrible. So that is really nasty. You don't want that anywhere near you. Well, especially if they get caught, and this is what happened only recently. We had a rat caught in our cupboard that stores our crockery, yeah, our plates and cups and what have you. And if you've got a rat stuck in there, stuck in there for the night and he's shitting everywhere, um, you're going to have to disinfect and clean all of all of that as well, just mm. you know, just in case. Mm. Yeah, chewing cables. That particular rat, I heard him the whole night making this noise this constant rattling yeah. noise and i turn the galley light on and there's a spare usb cable which is no longer used fortunately and this usb cable goes through a hole from inside the cupboard and the usb cable was moving up oh and down God. and i thought it was mr t yes yes but it turns out next day we found that we did have a rat on board and it can only have been that rat and when i eventually opened that cupboard next day and looked at that usb cable it had been properly chewed up Okay. Fortunately, as I say, we don't use that cable, but that could quite easily have been our, you know, depth sounder cable or, you know, navigation yeah. cable. So, yeah, you really don't want them on board. Um, there are certain ways of getting rid of them, and one of them you shouldn't do is to poison them mm -hmm. because if you poison them, uh, they'll go off and find a quiet little hole to die in. And that is something you do not want is the rocking, rotting uh, carcass of a, a rat stuck behind your um i don't know somewhere where you can't get to it yeah somewhere the rat can get to but you can't yeah. and it does happen so everybody says to everybody out here don't poison it don't poison it we use a cage and that works very well so we usually tempt it with a cage we usually put banana in it rats seem to love bananas yeah cage and banana yeah. works works perfectly so the animal is alive so if you don't want to kill it you can then take the cage a long way away and release it somewhere in India, we had a rat catcher. He was employed by the hotel that the pontoon was attached to. And I don't know whether it was part of his religion, but he would catch the rat and he'd walk down the pontoon and then he'd release it at the end of the pontoon into the, you know, by the shore. So, of course, the rat would then climb up onto the pontoon and come, come back. Straight back. And it was a very good way of keeping himself employed. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we'll link to a special we did on rats in the description. But uh, yeah, they will come on board. Just saying, it's nothing to do with being burnt dirty again. We, you know, people have commented, oh, you've got rats. Every, you know, time, dirty. every time we talk about rats, we always get the comments, oh, well, you've got to keep your boat clean. No, it has nothing to do with the cleanliness of your boat, I can assure you. And they can get on not just when you're on land. We know of a boat, particularly recently here, that was anchored out in the bay and they got a rat mm -hmm. and it had swum. What happens here in Indonesia in this particular part near, near Lombok is that you've got a lot of big rivers. And when you have big, heavy rains, the rivers really swell and they bring masses of stuff into the sea, into, mm -hmm. the, into, into the bays, including animals, including rats. So if those rats get, get hoisted out into the sea through the rivers, They'll, they'll cling on to anything and they climb onto her boat. So she got a rat that way. And it does happen. It happens on dinghies as well, doesn't it? Yeah, dinghies is a great place for a rat to hide. Mm. They're tired. Yeah. Sure. Again, you have to remember all these places, the ends of pontoons in marinas, dinghy docks, they are by the water's edge where possibly rubbish will collect. It is the perfect breeding ground for rats. So it, it, we have heard of people taking their dinghy back, hoisting their dinghy onto the boat. And of course, the rat who'd hidden away in a little crevice in your dinghy wakes up and the only place he can get on to land is your boat your boat becomes his land so yeah that um it does happen and it happens frequently these aren't sort of rare cases no. it happens all the time so it hasn't happened to us and i don't think we've met someone this has happened to but i've heard and read this happening to people that they get snakes in their dinghies and even on board so if you're in an area that has snakes they do say just do a quick double check before you get into your dinghy. They like to go into places that are warm and curl up. And so uh, I know, and I can't remember who it was, someone was telling us he had a snake in his engine. Don't blame him. Yeah, it was, it, that was some time ago. Well, we, we know of a couple um, who were up in Phuket and they'd left their boat on a mooring and they came back to it a couple of weeks later climbed aboard and the first thing they see in their cockpit was a snake. And this yeah. was a poisonous one as mm. well. 
So I think they had to get someone in to to remove it. So yeah, it can yeah. can happen. Yeah, I mean there are snakes all over the tropics. You know, you're living with snakes if you if you're in Florida and you're watching this, you know all about snakes. And America has loads of them. We don't really have them in the UK. We've got a couple of very harmless snakes. You do get them in parts of Europe, but snakes like rats, they are everywhere. They tend to be much more quiet and afraid and they don't normally come on ball but they you know they do mm. so it's just something you get used to really isn't it now who would win in a fight between <laughs> mr t the tokai and a snake i wonder oh, i think the snake would win mm. unless it was very small yeah. but i have read that tokais do take small rodents so they will eat mice um, and that's the other thing mice we've never had a mouse but you can get mice very easily on boats too Probably even more difficult to catch than a rat, I would have thought, a mouse. Yeah, yeah. Small little things they can get anywhere. Okay, so there's rodents, there's lizards, there's reptiles. Um, they're your own pets. Those are all things that you'll see all the time. And insects galore. <laughs> now, the other thing to remember when you're on a boat and you're enjoying being on a boat and you're enjoying being a part of nature is that there are birds everywhere too. We see the most amazing birds in the sky, the extraordinary eagles, ospreys, things like this, that tend to live in the areas where cruisers uh, moor and, uh, sorry, anchor, you know, so you tend to be somewhere very remote and you will see beautiful birds, won't you? Yes, I remember in India the dawn chorus that you would get. Obviously, being used to a dawn chorus in the UK and then moving to India and hearing India's dawn chorus, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely fabulous. It is just so loud, just amazing. The different bird songs that you would hear, and also the same bird songs as well. Crows, there were lots of crows there. Yeah. Talking of crows, they're yes. a bit naughty, aren't they? Yes, I was going to come on to that in a minute, because um, are you talking about the ones that used to dive bomb the Brahmi kites? No, no, I'm oh. talking about uh, ripping up your corking in your day. Oh, yes, yes. So we'll talk about um, leaving the boat and just being very, very careful that none of these things get on. But crows, yeah, they, they, they did that in Egypt, didn't they? Apparently, you were reminding me of this. The boat yes. next to us had been yes. left. And uh, so the crows were obviously using the caulking for their nest, I suppose. Well, they were, they'd get onto the boat and they would rip enormous, long, you know, snake-like lengths of caulking out of this poor boat and off they fly with it. And I guess they were making nests with it, but they were having a lovely time. Mm. So that was, uh, you know, I don't know what you can do about it. I think it was quite an old boat and the caulking was a bit, wasn't in the best of, I don't know, um, Perhaps once they got the first bit up, it then got easier and easier to take more and more bits. But yeah, that wasn't very good. But the other thing about birds is, of course, it is an orth ornithologist's dream being on a boat. You hear them all the time. If you're close enough, you'll see them all the time. And apart from the big birds, the, the kites and the eagles and so forth, um, you'll see smaller birds as you sail along the coast and even across the ocean. We've had birds, birds that have come and joined us, haven't we? We've had birds that have joined us and stayed on the boat for two or three days. Yeah. Uh, remember the first long crossing we did, we would, I can't remember which bird it was, but he would go off and then at sort of sunset, he'd come back and just circle around the boat and land on the boat, stay the night on the boat. Then next morning he'd go off and he wasn't going far, but he was getting his morning exercise in yeah. and then come back and uh, stay on the boat for the night. I remember exactly where it was. It was because I looked up what animal it was and it's a bridled tern and it was in the Red Sea and it went on for a long time and it would just sit on the roof, wouldn't it? Because mm. um, it was pretty nasty weather, poor things. And then out at sea and further out, we've had other things like kind of swift lit type type birds these birds that do the long migrations. And I know most cruisers will tell you that this happens. They'll come and sit on the boat with you because they need a rest because they're doing those thousand mile journeys. And mm. obviously they don't all make it. Remember the frigate, I think it was a frigate bird that uh, we had trying to land on our mast. Yeah. He was trying to land on the spreaders. And in fact, we've got video footage of this. Yeah. Uh, it, the sun was setting, it was dusk and uh, we were rocking and rolling oh so we were at anchor i thought you meant no 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 no. Oh. we were under passage right but uh you know we were moving with a lot of uh you know heavy weather 
and he was trying to take a rest. And of course, he was trying to land on the spreader, but the spreaders were moving backwards and forwards. Yeah, and I do. I can see it. He yeah. just couldn't land. And he must have tried this for about 20 minutes. And of course, every now and then he'd try and land on top of the mast, which we don't want him to do because that's where our wind instruments are. Yeah. So every now and then we were having to shake the rigging to stop yeah. him from landing on the top. And I felt a bit bad because he was clearly desperate for a rest. Yes, frigates. I mean, they do. They are supposed to st stay out at sea and be okay. I think maybe he was just chancing his arm a bit. But what what you say about the um, the mast tip? We do. I think did our Windex die because of that? Can't Possibly. remember. Possibly. But we know other people where they've snapped them off. You know, the crows will snap them off. But if you get a big bird landing on your mast, you know they'll snap off not intentionally. Antenna, Windexes, instruments like that. Um, certainly the big kites and the eagles when they when they get up there. <laughs> One of the worst things was fruit bats. Oh, actually, oh, oh, wasn't it? Yes, fruit bats in uh, Tiamen on the east coast of Malaysia. Uh, in fact, we went ashore to go and see the fruit bats nesting in the trees during the day. I mean, literally thousands upon yeah. thousands of these things. But at night time, of course, they'd wake up and that's when they start fluttering around looking for insects. And they loved boat rigging. Because it they was were, something to to hang on, wasn't it? There were three of us. There were three boats at anchor there, and they would come along, and they would try one boat after the other, and all three boats, all the crew, and all of the boats were all out on the deck, shouting and banging and shaking the rigging to try and stop them. It was quite funny. We'd go on for about half an hour. God, blimey. <laughs> they're enormous. I mean, these things are enormous. Wingspan yeah. of a meter or more. You know, crazy things. So and the other thing is um, birds that nest in the boom. We had one of those. Well, yeah. We've had a few over the years. If you're on land, quite we... quite common. Yes. That, that happens a lot. You see it a lot in boat yards. Now, next Marinas. time you're in a boat yard, go and have a look at uh, boats that have been left and uh, look to see if there's any bird activity. And quite often you'll see that birds have nested in the the end of booms uh, in the mast. I know we had a problem because we've got in mast furling. Uh, at one point, a bird had built a nest in the furling mechanism. So at springtime, when we came to do our first sail and we got the sail out, a whole load of bird's <laughs> nest fell on the deck. I'm happy to say, fortunately, it was empty. Yes, the bird had, had left. But... but you'll see most cruising boats, when they're um, leaving them on land or even in a marina for some time, they'll shove things in those holes, in those cracks, won't they? Because they know that they'll get a nest if they don't. Mm. We've certainly had nests, so yeah. Oh, little things. Um, so birds generally are wonderful. We love birds. We love birds, and if they want to try a nest, they can, but preferably not. I think, as you said, it is an ornithologist dream, yes. and uh, you know, every, every boat has a pair of binoculars. So there's nothing quite like sitting at sunset or at sunrise in the morning in your cockpit with your pair of bins, having a look at some of these wonderful, beautiful tropical birds, and hearing that dawn chorus. Mm. Wow, that, I mean, that that don't, that's really special. So, the, oh yes, I forgot to say about turns. One of the reasons that sailors love turns so much is because they are an aid to navigation, aren't they? Because if there's a log in the water, you quite often can't see it from the deck. But what you can see is five little turns sitting in a row. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. There is one creature, one animal that we haven't talked about, which is perhaps the most <laughs> obvious when it comes to being on a boat, being in the water. Little fishes. Yes. Well, we had um, an entire reef of fishes following us for most of Sulawesi. We did. Um, we've got video footage mm. of that where we dunked the GoPro off the swimming platform and you could see, even as we were motoring, this school of fish mm. that had sat under the transom and stayed with us for many days. Weeks. It, it was weeks because I used to see them as I dropped the anchor as we as we as we'd stop and drop the anchor, I suddenly see all these little sergeant major fish coming around, and then when we went to this is how I discovered them. Went then when we went to leave and we pulled the anchor up, they they'd stay for a bit, then they'd rush past me towards the end of the boat, and off we'd go, and I'd go down to the end of the boat to put the snubber away, look over the side, and there they were. I'm sure it was the same fish. You sure? Pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> Baby sergeant major fish, and they were with us for weeks. 
And we lost them eventually. When yeah. I think when we anchored in 30 plus meters of water yeah. uh, or, or off a reef. But hopefully they found a new home. Yeah. But there was another fish that we actually had for, and I think I calculated it as being nine months. Right. And that was a remora, yeah. which are known as the sucker fish. These are the fish that quite often you'll see them in photographs and nature documentaries stuck to whales. Mm. Uh, we've seen them on turtles, but they also love the hulls of boats mm. and this remora stayed with us for many many months and we know it's the same remora because he actually had a cut a scar on his on his head yeah he was big he was very he was big old. i used to go down and swim <laughs> around him and we'd we'd play kiss chase around <laughs> the boat uh yeah and we got to the point where we were actually feeding him because back then we had millie on board yeah. so liz would uh uh, throw bits of bread over the side yeah. and of course the remora would come out come up to the surface and eat the bread she to, loved it yeah millie's delight she yeah. loved it yeah so i didn't do any fishing off the side when we had him because i think the first time i discovered him we caught him or we nearly caught him and so we realized he was down there uh, so there was no fishing going on then but yeah he stayed with us with us for ages so that's it we've had fish we've had reptiles insects a cat certainly rats We've had most of the things that we've mentioned and if you're on a boat or you're going to get a boat you most likely will as well so just be prepared to sit back and enjoy all those beautiful animals that we live with day in and day out on our boats because let's face it living on a boat is really about being with nature yeah. you know whether you're out doing an ocean passage and you're seeing big pelagic fish or whether you're ashore and you're watching birds through your binoculars, you are surrounded by nature. And it is one of the great things about living on a boat. Uh, but uh, with some of those beautiful, good animals come the nasty, creepy crawlies as well. So just be prepared for them.